Hello, everyone. So glad you're with us. And uh, we'll have Jeff Brown uh, open up for us. All right. Well, thank you, Simon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second of a series of conversations in pursuit of continuing to build trust and empathy and creating new connections and allies. I want to start by reiterating Association's Forum's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion through our focus on welcoming environment and our role as a convener of opportunities for association professionals to understand the importance of racial justice, equal rights, and the issues faced by marginalized communities. For much of the last week, I've been inspired by the action in the streets and the conversations taking place in spaces like this one. I'm cautiously optimistic that this series of, event, of events may be the catalyst for moving into a more equal and inclusive society. I've also been challenged to think about what we need to do to begin moving forward. Well, that seems like a daunting prospect for one person to consider. You know, if this is the time, if this time is going to be different, individuals and institutions must make it known that discrimination, hatred, and injustice are unacceptable and have no place in our society. Those statements must be supported by focused action that reshapes historic constructs of race and privilege, sound policy that empowers and lifts up marginalized communities, and the social and financial resources necessary for lasting change. This country still has a long way to go in fulfilling the promise of liberty and justice for all, and this moment in time has to push us in that direction. Today, we're joined by Simon T. Bailey, author, life coach, and entrepreneur, who will moderate today's dialogue and push us to dig deeper and think bigger. We're also fortunate to have a great group of panelists. We're joined once again by Alderman Rod Sawyer from the 6th District, Melvin Tennant, President and CEO of Meet Minneapolis and a member of the Forum Board of Directors, Paul Pomerant, CEO of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and Pat Blake, President and CEO of the Heart Rhythm Society. Thank you all for joining us. And now I'll turn it over to Simon to facilitate today's dialogue. Jeff, thank you so much. Welcome everyone. And I wanna, I wanna jump right in because we, this is gonna be really good. Second time around and uh, so happy to see all of our panelists. I wanna start with the first question and, and want to get the feedback from uh, any of the panelists, when you first heard about George Floyd's death, what was your initial thought or reaction? Well, Simon, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in. It's uh, uh, good to be with you again, and I'm uh, glad to be a part of this, this great, uh, great panel. Mm -hmm. But uh, living in the city where that uh, tragedy took place, um, it, was, it was like, um, it was disbelief for me personally. It was uh, surreal that we're, we're having this conversation again. Um, the fact that it, the, that tragedy picked up so much momentum so, uh, so quickly let me know that it was, was clearly uh, a tipping point for us. And I'm, I'm hoping that we can continue to uh, use that tragedy as a, as a platform for some real honest dialogue. So it was, it was, it was shock and belief like most of us then. Sure. Alderman, Alderman Sawyer, what was your initial reaction or thought? Wow. Uh, it was uh, not again. That was, I thought that rushed in my head at first. Uh, you know, uh, being, living in, a, in an urban area, in a large city, in a predominantly black area, this is not new. And uh, we've heard this story uh, far too many times before. Now with technology, it's being recorded and uh, for everyone to see. Uh, we've, but we've experienced this before, uh, not just in deaths, but serious injuries and, and overzealousness by certain members of the police force. Uh, so this is not novel, but uh, the fact that it was recorded for all to see, uh, there's a portion, like uh, I know all of you have had teacups in the past, you know, there's a certain level of pressure that gets there and it just has to explode. And I think that was that tipping point, like you said, that caused the, uh, the release of the pressure and the explosion that happened, not just in Minneapolis, but all over the country. Am I, I, I might be breaking up a little bit, sorry. Um, you know, the, the first reaction, of course, is that you can't really believe it's happening. I mean, we know it's happening. Um, the, my second reaction is that could have been my son. I, I have a biracial son and of course, as a mother, that's the immediate thought. And then you realize it was somebody's son. Um, and, and just sort of the horror of, of all of it, 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 
it's quite per we know, I mean, we have heard that these things happen. This is so in your face. I think that's why so many white folks have gotten behind it this time. They cannot deny it anymore. How can you deny that? And I think it's been really comfortable for people of light skin to pretend these things aren't happening. And I think this is a situation where you can no longer do that. Pat, has your husband had the conversation that we call in the black community with your son? Yeah, you know, one of the things as a, as a white person, you know, I, I didn't know this was an issue. I was raised on a dairy farm in a small town. I mean, so, you know, obviously no big deal. Then I marry a black man and have a, a black son. Um, and I remember very, very early conversations where my husband was talking to my son about, um, you're always going to be a black man, you're a black man, you're a black boy, you're black, and, and all of the things that you need to worry about and think about and, and, and be careful about. And every time you go into a store and when you're walking down the street and when you're riding your bicycle. And as a white person, that, of course, is a revelation because we don't, you know, my brothers weren't, didn't have to be taught that, um, but my son did. And, and that is something that most white folks don't understand, don't know, or refuse to believe. Paul, uh, what was your initial reaction when you heard about George Floyd's death? Sure, sure. The, uh, you know, it, was, it was a couple. It was a, a kind of a complex uh, uh, set of feelings because I, uh, I returned from a trip and I watched it on, on TV. And it was, I watched like you know, millions of other people uh, in extreme horror. And uh, it, it just struck me that... It, this can't be, uh, to Melvin's point, it can't be happening again. But it also hit me that, is this America? You know, is this what, what we are, what we become? Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that uh, uh, struck me in part was, this is happening at a moment in time, not isolated, at a moment in time that our society has really been struggling mm -hmm. with issues of race and identity and justice for uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of groups and, and the issues of fairness. So I was really, I felt like, um, you know, given the moment we're in, the political rhetoric, I felt like, is our society going to come apart? I felt fear. I felt concern. I felt sadness. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to say that in the last week, that, that, that fear and concern has transitioned to a hopefulness. I, I, I hope we'll be talking about that. Uh, but what, what really um, emerged for me uh, uh, in my work with, with my members, uh, with my community, is uh, my uh, colleagues of, of, uh, of color coming to me and say, saying to me, we got to talk about this. We can't just, you know, this isn't something that, you know, just lives on TV, something that, you know, but we, we have to talk about this. It's affecting my ability to work for you. We need to know you know, uh, that, uh, that you and ASA and the association community is going to help uh, solve this. So I think, um, so again, sadness, fear, but also a sense of responsibility hmm. and a sense of opportunity. Hmm. Melvin, uh, I think everyone is curious, how is Minneapolis doing right now? The, uh, I would say that they're, is an emergence to uh, towards hopefulness with uh, similar to what Paul said, but I'll say there's still a level of intensity of discussion that is, that is palpable. Uh, mm -hmm. We still have peaceful protests nearly every day. Uh, there are basically every meeting that I'm in, we are talking about the tragic death of Mr. Floyd. Uh, the, the city is, uh, is hopeful, but I believe that there's still a lot of us who are, are waiting to see that this is going to facilitate some, some real change. Um, you know, Simon, as, as, uh, as, as uh, others have said, the, the alderman, we, we've seen this movie before, and I, I uh, have seen a lot of news stories re recounting the, the other incidents of black Americans being killed uh, in custody of police. Um, NPR did a story last week and it chronicled uh, since Eric Garner's uh, chokehold death in New York since 2014, a hundred black Americans that have been 
kill, and they don't believe that that list is comprehensive. Wow. So I'm hoping that what we see, not just in Minneapolis, but across the country, is that there's going to be a real recognition that there is a problem. We have a lot of, of uh, interest in civic and corporate um, entities wanting to help, but that help needs to be sustained and it needs to be sincere. Mm. Mm. Alderman Sawyer, we we're curious to hear your wisdom. Uh, everyone has a different life experience and in the association world, so much work is done by committee and it can be hard to align viewpoints and get all the decision makers to agree upon next steps or actions or even messaging. Do you have any wisdom for everyone listening on how do you start those complex conversations and how do you help get decision makers uh, to the table and moving forward in the same direction? That's a great question. I, I think, first of all, you have to get people a little bit out of their comfort zones. Uh, this is a good time for uncomfortable conversations. Uh, we have to talk about uh, realities that go on uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, as, as so to speak. Uh, as, as much as I like to think that the police are all at fault, it's not always the case. You know, so we have to have those types of conversations. Again, they're not comfortable. Uh, I, I, you know, to make people squirm in their seats a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we, we want to make white people squirm, but we also want to make black people squirm. You know, everybody needs to feel a little bit uncomfortable going forward as we're talking about these things that will ultimately heal us. But at the same time, we still have to go through that pain and that hurt. And, and, and we may even point some fingers at for a moment and we may have some harsh words toward each other for a moment. At the end of the day, if we don't do that, uh, we're never going to get past it. So I think the first thing is to, to be willing to have an uncomfortable conversation with each other. Okay, okay. thank you, that's great. Uh, Pat, what are inequities and when you've seen inequities in your organization, how did you address inequities? Well, as an association exec, we really are dealing with two, two pieces of the pie. One of them, of course, is our staff, which, which we have um, control over, I think is the best way to say it, certainly the policies and the procedures and all those kinds of things. And then we have our whole volunteer, our member network, which we have not nearly as much control over. Um, and, and of course, how you deal with the inequities on both sides is, is, is a bit different. Um, certainly uh, on the staff side, um, for years, those of us who have been um, working on, on DE&I issues have, have learned from each other and learned from the field um, some best practices. Um, but I still think that, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me. We still tiptoe. You know, there's no question. You know, I'm married to a black man. I have, you know, biracial kids. But we still tiptoe around these issues. And, and it was a, a week ago Monday when I addressed my staff, I actually read um, a, a, an article written by a black woman and it was titled something like, and I'm going to get this wrong, but it was like, your black colleagues may look like they're doing okay, but they're probably not. And, and it was really dealing with the fact that black folks hide, have to hide these feelings and, and, and pretend that things don't hurt and pretend they're not angry and all those kinds of things. And so it was a, a, a really good um, way for me to, to give permission, I think, not that I should have to, frankly, which is a sad state in and of itself, but to sort of give permission to the black folks to feel and express what they feel. And that goes to Alderman, to your, to your difficult conversations, to sort of give permission to have those difficult conversations and to maybe demand them almost um, from each other. So staff side's easier. On the volunteer side, I think that's, you know, I, I'm in the healthcare arena, um, a subspecialty of cardiology. We have a, a, a very difficult time with our pipeline in terms of um, minorities and underrepresented minorities, certainly. Um, and, you know, we have a DE&I committee and we're working on things. But to be very honest, that side of the house is much more challenging for me. Uh, women is a big issue even for us and, and then underrepresented minorities even further. So every day, now we talk about it though. Now I don't have to be the only one leading the charge. That's a difference to me. Now my president is saying, what are we doing about this? Where before I, I wasn't even on the radar screen. Um, so is it progress? 
God, I hope so. Um, you know, but we can't just keep talking. We got to do something. Can you give an example of just pay inequity or what you did internally uh, with uh, just I, helping people understand I, I, that? I, I can. And in fact, this is, you know, so there, there are times when you get disappointed um, as a CEO, and this was one of them. Um, I recently did a compensation study, so a survey to look at all of the salaries. Um, and, and when that was completed, I asked my HR um, manager, my HR director, to go through it and look at a lens, look at it from the lens of our black and brown skinned people. You know, our, our, what is our pay equity across that lens? Um, and, and, you know, and the other lenses too, but that was an important lens to me. And my CFO, who is Jamaican American, and my HR director, who's African American, both stopped. I mean, I'm just thinking I'm asking what everyone would ask. Of course, that's an important lens. And they both said, we have never, ever had anyone ask us to do that before. And it, it broke my heart, frankly. I mean, that, that, that wasn't just a routine kind of thing to do. Um, makes me realize how unaware people are of the inequity of this, uh, of this world, uh, uh, certainly of pay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so everyone listening is a practical next step because part of the, today's conversation is a way forward. What can we do immediately? What would it be like to address the inequities in your organization? All right. The next, uh, next question, this is for, for all the panelists. We'd love to hear your feedback. What would you tell industry leaders to do when they encounter members or leaders who make racist or insensitive comments and statements? What would you tell industry leaders to do when they encounter members or leaders who make racist or insensitive comments or statements? Well, uh, I'll, I'll start <clears throat> a little bit. I'm not sure I'm gonna answer this exactly, but. Uh, one of the things, uh, as this conversation has, has opened, and, and uh, I really appreciate Pat's remarks because they really reflect that we're a healthcare organization, too. We're seeing a lot of the same, same trends. Um, on, and I'll just talk about the, the member side uh, for, for a second. So as things uh, began, and I'll talk about the staff side later, but on the member side, as, uh, as the dialogue protests, um, articles, news coverage began to uh, increase, we felt like many folks that we should put a statement out there. And uh, what we're finding is we could put out a million statements. It's not going to do, you know, what needs to be done. And everybody was coming up with a statement. And, and the more statements that were out there, I believe, uh, the hollower the communication. And, uh, but, but we did put together a, uh, a statement that I think was simple and, and uh, intended to be helpful. And, and what that did was it actually started a, uh, a conversation in the community, in our, our professional community of people who felt the statement went, uh, didn't go far enough, or, and people who felt uh, it went too far, that we shouldn't be addressing uh, social issues and, and, and uh, issues of racial justice within our organization. It opened up a dialogue, and, and what began to happen is uh, a lot of our members stepped forward and began to share their experiences with us. Some with uh, our, our elected uh, president, some with uh, myself, some with other uh, members of the staff, and shared their experiences of uh, of hurt, of things that were you know said inappropriately, things that were not said, and what what we began to realize through this is that these these experiences were. Uh, profound and, and much more, um, I was going to say, much more common uh, than I ever thought about, the sense of being excluded, uh, somehow mocked in some way, their, uh, uh, their experiences made light of or not important, or the fact that uh, racial disparities, you know, uh, were no longer, you know, uh, uh, for uh, many of uh, their colleagues, making remarks that these are no longer issues in America when they were. And so, um, what, what we're, we're going to do and to help increase sensitivity, we're going to do things on the staff side. But on the member side, what we thought was we're going to create a forum for these stories to be shared. And, uh, and, and again, all this is new. All this is being you know, created a, a, as we talk. We're trying to uh, think through more vibrant ways of sharing communication. But one will be very simple, a podcast story, like a story core uh, uh, effort. For, for people, uh, uh, people of color, people uh, LGBTQ, uh, others to share stories of discrimination, 
insensitivity, and give people a sense of how this feels uh, on the other side when it's received. That's one step. And I think uh, 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 from my, my perspective, and I, I've had to say, I, you know, as I've talked to staff, I've had to start with uh, 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 every conversation with, I don't know where I've earned. I don't know where I've gone across the boundary and said the wrong thing. And I, I've, I've said, you know, I'm not sure even if I'm saying the right thing now. I'm committed to having this discussion. I'm committed to listening, you know, if you'll, if you'll help me. And so that's, that's all part of it, is just getting people to open up. We're at the right time in history. I think people really want to talk about these, these things and make it better. And I think our responsibility is to provide opportunities for people to, to listen and to be heard. Great. Who else? Um, uh, my pastor always told me, if you can't say amen, say out. <laughs> you know, sometimes these things, and, and, I, and I think sometimes people don't think that black people don't have inappropriate conversations as well. And again, this is part of what this uncomfortability for now. You know, I've, I've experienced uh, both hearing and, quite honestly, saying things that might be construed as inappropriate uh, amongst either friends or even colleagues. Um, you know, and, and I admit that. I, I, I can say that from you know, speaking personally. Uh, I've said things either out of frustration or aggravation that, that I probably should not have said. Uh, you know, I might have gone beyond the pale um, of what was considered appropriate. So uh, with that, uh, you know, I say it's not just white people that can say things that are inappropriate. You know, we can and we do. And I think that's something that we need to talk about, that we also say things that, that we would not want repeated on the five o'clock news. So mm -hmm. that's my personal admission <laughs> to you, everyone on the call. Thank you. So, so true. So true. And, and I think both what Alderman has said and, and what Paul has said is being self-aware and being honest enough to say, hey, I said something, it was inappropriate, I own it. And, and that's the thing, people can see that you're vulnerable, that you're gonna own it. Uh, a question, uh, Pat and, and, and Melvin, and certainly Alderman and, and, and Paul, what are associations or organizations saying or doing differently as a result of George Floyd's death? Because I think in time past, there's been a lot of talk mm -hmm. and talk is cheap. What, what are you seeing that's actionable relatable happening real time i'll jump in if you don't if you don't mind we um with regard to um the death of of mr floyd one of the very first things we did is uh send a letter out to all of our our clients and uh phone calls to to, to folks just to let them know that we obviously don't condone what happened that's not really what our community is about. So we, we wanted folks to know that. But in general, the good news is that we've, we've established strong relationships with our customers over the years. And most of our customers knew that. Just as a sidebar, of all the letters that we sent out to all of our clients, we got back probably 100 very positive responses saying, we, we stand with you for seeking uh, justice and equality. Um, although, frankly, we did have some some of our, our customers uh, expressed some concern, wondering how could this happen in your city? So we communicated, first of all, and made sure that all of our folks had, had the information that they needed. But even before that, we, we did the, uh, a, a town hall, an organic town hall meeting of our staff to let them express their concerns, frustrations, but more importantly, express ideas about what the path forward is. So uh, we started with, with our with our core team, and then we fanned out to uh, to try to communicate and make sure that everybody had the tools they needed. Okay. You know, I, I think sometimes, and this is where, uh, this is the frustrating part, is that, you know, many of us have been talking about some of these issues for a long time. And, you know, and I've heard my colleagues for the last decade say, well, I can't, you know, I can't find any qualified black and brown people which of course makes me want to throw chairs across the room, it always has. Um, and, you know, and, and part of it is putting into action things, simple, simple things, like you can't hire diverse people if you don't interview them. So 
you cannot give me a slate of candidates to interview that aren't that isn't diverse. That's just it, not acceptable. You teach your people that. You teach your staff that. I mean, those are there's some there's some simple things that I think we overlook sometimes um, that that I believe at least at a grassroots level or at my level, whatever I can do is can make a difference. And that's those are the kinds of things that we need to say again. Apparently we need to say again because they're not that's not just talk. That's doing. Um, so I think those are those are important. And you know, and for me, you know, I look at resumes and they're trying to get rid of all the ethnicity on all the resumes. And of course I want that because I want to be sure that I'm bringing in a diverse group of people. So we work against ourselves sometimes, I think, in, in terms of trying to be fair. And I understand that if you're looking at it from the other way, you know, but neither here nor there. I, I do think that, um, you know, that our organizations can do things uh, again with my organization. We've been focused in many ways on women because they're so underrepresented in our field, too. But things like we won't endorse programs that aren't diverse. Um, people pay a fee to have our logo and we're no longer giving we're no we're not taking money and putting our logo on anything that doesn't have a diverse faculty. Um, and we've gotten pushback um, and we've said, well, too bad. You know, we just too bad. But that took some courage. Now, that's more women than it is than it is African-Americans or brown skinned people. The pipeline is where we have to go with that. That's the critical issue trying to get folks into our profession. And that's really where we're trying to focus. We do have a lot of members who are allied professionals, nurses, uh, physician assistants. That's where the other just the other day we said, you know what? we're not paying attention to that group, not, not in terms of a diversity um, initiative. And that's the group we can probably impact the fastest and the best. So it's too soon for me to tell you what we're doing there because literally it was like last Friday that we all kind of went, duh, this is a place we can start and probably make a difference pretty quickly. Um, so that's our next step is how can we really start influencing our pipeline in all the different directions? Right. And as you're thinking about strategies and, and specific things that you can do, I hope that you're listening to some of the feedback from the panelists. I'm going to shift gears and we've got some questions coming through the chat and I want to honor those questions. One of the questions, and this is for all the panel, how would you suggest a younger professional go about bringing actionable change within their organization? Well, I'll start. Um, the, uh, in, in our uh, Talk, uh, talk to your boss, talk to your chief, talk to HR, talk to the CEO. I can't tell you, you know, on the Monday following um, Memorial Day, uh, Memorial Day, when this happened, one of my uh, young, young uh, uh, black staff members approached me and said, are we going to talk about this? And um, I can't tell you what a profound impact that, that had on me. I didn't realize to the point that was made earlier, uh, the sadness that she felt and uh, how, how, how heavy this weighed on her and the, the need to, for her work to be part of a solution, not part uh, continuing part of the problem. So I would think that most of uh, your bosses really want to hear how you feel about this, want to have that conversation. Uh, many may be um, open to the conversation or ready to sit. Some may be a little nervous about the conversation. But I think if you're, um, uh, uh, but I think, I was going to say, everybody will want to have that conversation if you're willing to, to, to open it. And frankly, if they don't want to have that conversation, well, that may tell you something else. But I, 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 I think we're, in, we're, we're at a moment that uh, the, this conversation is dominating our society right now. And uh, I think my colleagues across the board want to engage with, with our young staff members who want to, want to talk about it. Alderman Sawyer? I couldn't agree with Paul enough. I think that's something that, that needs to, to happen. Um, I would suggest uh, that the, the your young staffers or, or particularly those that live in areas that are affected, uh, go out and do something positive. You know, step out of your comfort zone and, and go. And I think we had a part of this conversation last week where we, I even invited uh, you guys to come out to a variety of neighborhoods and just see what's going on uh, both the uh, great neighborhoods we have. I'm proud of all my neighborhoods, but I will acknowledge that some of my neighborhoods have, have challenges, have struggles, but I, I want people to see that. And I want people to kind of step out there to really understand, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been born and raised in the same neighborhood where I live in. Never lived 
with the exception of college, more than a mile from where I was born. Mm. So, uh, you know, I'm in my neighborhood and, and I see, I've seen the changes, both good and bad. But mm. uh, a lot of people have not seen that. You know, you, you talk to young African Americans in particular that have gotten to a certain level of success, they've matriculated through school and they've got good jobs, maybe with some of you in the association, they're, they're doing well. Uh, oftentimes, the first thing they do is they move, you know, closer to the job, which is, which is sensible. I understand that, but it takes them out of their traditional neighborhoods. They've moved downtown. They moved in Chicago. They moved to the south or the west. Uh, they've gotten away from um, Inglewood. They've gotten away from Park Manor. They've gotten away from, uh, you know, all the neighborhoods that they've come up from, and sometimes they don't go back. And mm -hmm. and I need people to visit back, come back, and reach back and, and provide a helping hand, uh, mentor a school, mentor a student, do something mm -hmm. that will uh, bring someone else, lift someone else up, mm -hmm. I should say. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, I, I think a, a couple of things as a as a, a young professional, and of course it's so difficult to, to give advice because the environments are so very, very different. But, but the first thing I would say is, is seek out someone who is like thinking. And, and I would suggest that if it's not someone, that, that it's even better if it's someone that's not your same skin color. Um, but, but it feels better if you're not alone. And, and to everyone's point, this is a time um, that, that the doors are as open as I've ever seen them be in terms of potentially bridging some of those gaps and starting those conversations. So that would be the first thing that I would suggest is find like-minded people um, because that feels better. The second thing that I would suggest is that many professionals and, and certainly in association forum, we've encouraged people to get to know people, their peers, their marketing peers in other groups, their accounting peers in other groups, their meeting peers in other groups. What are other associations doing? Because sometimes you can bring those ideas back in. You can say, you know, so-and-so at this organization, they've tried this. Do you think that's something? You could talk to your supervisor or if you have an open CEO um, that or someone who's willing to listen anywhere sort of up and down the chain, start having those conversations. What are the ideas? Because many people don't know what to do. And, and when, and especially people in power, CEOs, whatever, we're used to having all the answers or thinking people expect us to have all the answers. This is the time we need to be very vulnerable and we need to try to be very open to say we don't know how to solve, that we don't know necessarily what to do. As Paul said, we, we don't even know if we're saying the right things. Um, but, but this is when ideas can come in. And if we can be open to them and encourage our staff to be open, maybe we can come up with, and maybe as a young professional, you can really make a difference because you can bring in new and different uh, and innovative ideas. Awesome. Um, and I would just, just add really to piggyback on what Paul said, speak to your manager, but I would even put some formality to it, put a plan together. I like to be able to react to something. If a young professional has, has put a plan together for a need that they see within the organization or the industry, um, I believe those of us who are CEOs would react, would react very favorably to that. So um, put the onus back on the young professional, put a plan together that's well thought out. Uh, we've had a number of task forces in our organization to deal with certain issues, whether it's moving our office space. Uh, we even have a task force right now envisioning what the future of work is moving back into our office. So that's a great opportunity to get leadership skills, but also to force you to put uh, your, your, uh, your ideas on paper, which a lot of us react well to when we can see it, so we can uh, be able to, to understand it better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question, and please continue to post your question uh, in the chat or in the Q&A in, in, in Zoom. Here's an interesting question. What do you do when you are feeling deflated and defeated? I made a presentation to the chiefs, uh, the C-suite, VPs, CEO of my organization, and no action was taken. How do you encourage yourself to keep fighting? Well, uh, two things, uh, one unrelated, but I think uh, there, there's a need for uh, uh, tenacity here. Uh, um, I, I like what, uh, what Melvin said uh, about the plan. I think that's an important part of it. So maybe, you know, rethinking your conversation, replaying it in your head. 
how was it received? Where did, you know, what resonated, what didn't? I like what uh, Pat said too, find, you know, find a, a colleague, an ally, somebody who will help advocate with you. But I also think tenacity is important. I, I think that uh, this is a time when people are really listening, but it's a, it, it's, um, it's a very difficult, uh, it's a difficult conversation. I would come back, you know, uh, try it again, one-on-one. I, I can tell you, I feel very strongly that the organizations that are going to survive well uh, coming out of the uh, pandemic, out of this economic catastrophe, and out of this, this uh, you know, uh, civil uh, uh, discussion we're having, are those that truly have had these conversations, have embraced tra- change, and have, have, uh, have taken action. And uh, uh, so I think uh, if you... Uh, if, you, if, you're, if your leadership is thinking forward, they're going to find a way to bridge that gap. And I would just say, be tenacious. Don't be obnoxious, but be tenacious. Bring solutions, bring data, bring help. But, uh, but you know, as I, I look across the landscape of associations, of healthcare organizations, of people that uh, uh, I admire, I look like at what we have to accomplish as an organization going forward, we have to address these, this situation internally to be successful. So I think people are listening. Uh, and I do want to follow up uh, just on an aside, but with the, uh, the alderman's uh, uh, offer, uh, the forum is uh, very willing. In fact, we're, we're try- we want to schedule a trip. Uh, and so Michelle Mason will uh, reach out uh, to find what would work with your schedule, but we'd like to have some of our um, uh, asso- association forum uh, leadership and others really come down and visit the communities that you'd like to suggest and have those conversations to really see what's taking place. That's beautiful. So, Important. Paul, I, I'd like to push back just a little bit. On, on, sure. So, when we say to people, be tenacious, or even Melvin a little bit, you know, put all a plan together, you know what? So many of these people have been tenacious their whole life. And, 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 and it, it must feel like pushing against a wall that doesn't budge. And, and so I, I guess I would say I have a lot of empathy for, for people running out of energy to, to, to fight another day, sort of. And so, so I, I think, I mean, shame on those CEOs or those VPs or whatever, because even if they don't agree with the plan, if they're not seriously looking and trying to be empathetic about the courage it even took to put it together, um, you know, shame on them. So I agree with you. I understand. But we've been saying to these folks for a long time, just be tenacious, just keep trying, just keep pushing, just keep pushing. And, and it's taken the death of George Floyd to, to get us to maybe listen. There's been a lot of people who've been tenacious for a long time to, for no good. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just frustrated for, for all of us, I guess, sometimes. Melvin? Well, I, I appreciate that, Pat. Um, I'm a product of being tenacious in my career as a black leader, and I've had to face a lot of adversity. Sure. Uh, I'm not saying that I deserve anything that I've received, but um, I get pushback even now. You would think that as you get to be a CEO that, oh, things are great, the door is open, everything's going to be peachy that is far from the case. So I'm still dealing with it. So I would still say to the young professionals, uh, it it might be frustrating at times, but unfortunately in the society in which we live, you will always have to be tenacious, particularly as a person of color, uh, rising up through uh, corporate America. This next question. I'll just uh, add one more thing. I completely agree with Pat. I mean, that that really is a good, 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 uh, good point. I, I do think this moment is different. I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic about the moment we're in. I agree. But the other thing I, I'd, I'd like to say for uh, that person wishing to move the, the debate uh, forward, the, the discussion forward, take advantage of the resources of the association forum. I think we have some good stuff, especially with what uh, the forum has launched in terms of the welcoming environment initiative and the, the committees and, and support for that. I think it's a great opportunity to learn show leadership within the activities of the forum and gather data that will help move your organization forward. So, you know, it, it, it's at least one place to build resources and build a community of change. Okay. This next question, I want to start with Alderman Sawyer and then get feedback from the rest of the panelists. Uh, Alderman, uh, safety has risen 
to be a much higher priority. What are some things you have been doing to increase safety and safe spaces during these unsettling times in your, in your, in your district, in your area? That's a very interesting question in that I just left a press conference this morning and it might spark some, some interesting comments, but uh, what I was advocating on behalf of a youth group was the removal of Chicago police officers from public schools. Now, at first blush, you would think that, you know, we're taking safety away from the schools, but in fact, what I was, I come to realize in that, although it may have been well-intentioned, police officers actually contributed to the incarceration of black youth, particularly black males, in that particular school where they reside, where they worked. Uh, it, so it had an opposite effect of providing safety. So we have to look at what safety means to individuals. So in this instance, uh, historically what, what the policemen were there for schools were for outside threats to a school. But it, it transformed into them criminalizing the students where they were working. So instead of, uh, you know, the kids getting to, come on, we've, we were all kids at one point in time. You get into a fist fight or you said something inappropriate. Now it's a criminal offense if you're going to jail as opposed to getting detention or cleaning the blackboards if I don't even know if they have blackboards anymore. But, you know, doing something restorative at the school for uh, temporary bad behavior. So I know we're not talking about, I know we're talking about more of safety. But this was something that, that just came to me this morning. Uh, I was asked to speak on it and, and even asked me to champion this to the city. You know, we have to really reevaluate what safety means. Uh, safety is not just uh, armed security. Safety could mean education. Safety could be additional resources that would prevent someone from doing something. In your corporate setting, you know, maybe mental uh, checkups or behavioral checkups could be the norm as opposed to having more security personnel uh, at your entrances or on your floors. Uh, you know, additional restorative justice uh, resources, things like that. I mean, those are safety initiatives as well, and they're not just the in-your-face armed guards, uh, you know, that makes some people feel safe. But to me, I think that's more of an occupation than a sense of safety. Mm -hmm. Pat, Paul, Melvin, safety. I, we're not. We're not really dealing with. You know, our our, our physicians, our our allies are in hospitals. I've not yet heard much issues around that. Um, you know, and we're not back in the offices yet. So, I, I'm not. That's sort of not in my headspace at this moment. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to move on. We've got some great questions coming in. One question is, do you have advice for dealing with a staff member who may not be overtly racist, but uses language that indicates implicit agreement with nationalist or racist ideas? It's a subtle disagreement with, uh, with my challenge to the team to educate ourselves first, then take action. Any advice for this particular person? I think uh, I'll, I'll start. I, I think it's a, an organizational uh, imperative to provide training. This this has happened, uh, unfortunately, everywhere I've been. And, and you do have certain um, uh, guardrails of things that you just don't accept uh, when they're reported. And uh, so that's one level. I, I prefer to deal with things on a constructive, proactive basis. Uh, and so, uh, and to this point, we are at this point we're getting ready for um, a uh, sort of a massive uh, educational effort of our whole staff around um, uh, around uh, diversity around inclusion around implicit bias about understanding you know uh, about uh, reflecting and understanding the impact of, of what we say we know it's it's going to be a long road but I think it's uh, it's an imperative for every organization to assess where they are and to undertake uh, to facilitate the right conversations, but also to provide that kind of education that will help uh, move this conversation forward. 
the uh, but it's it's a, it's a hard question. Those things do happen, and depending on the severity of it, it, it could be a something we discuss uh, uh, one on one, or it could be something that leads to a, an HR discussion. We live in a time when people are picking up a lot of language from uh, the wrong sources, and we we really need to be very thoughtful in the workplace about creating a place uh, to what you said before that feels safe, that feels welcoming. And I think we could do that through training. So anyway. It, it, you know, Simon, I, I, as Paul was talking, I, you know, you ask about safety. And, and I actually said to my staff, and I forgot this, that, that the, very, the most important thing is that, that our, our workplace needs to be safe. I mean, that that's, you know, that is critical. So I guess we, I mean, even though we're remote, it's still, we still need to be safe. But the unconscious bias training is really critical. That's an annual mandated um, training uh, for, for us. Now it takes on more significance, I think, than it, than it ever did before. The, you know, I, I, the, the, the most difficult, for me at least, to deal with, the most difficult kinds of people are the ones that are, that are racist, but they, they're smart enough or whatever it is to be right underneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult because it's so, it, you, it, you can't catch them. You can't, I mean, I, that sounds like a horrible way to say it, but I mean that. I mean, it's very difficult to deal with it when, when you can't pinpoint it or when you can't call it out specifically. And so I struggle with that. I mean, it's, and all, all I know to do is to continue to talk about um, you know, the kind of environment that we want to live in and the kind of environment that we will thrive in and then do training. But it, it is a, that's a really difficult question. And I am glad you ask it because those are the kinds of things that, that as CEOs, we need to struggle with every day. Uh, how do we deal with that? That's an important question. Mm -hmm. I would just uh, ask, uh, and I'm sure both Paul and Pat would agree, the first thing is creating that appropriate organizational culture which does take time. Uh, you don't want to have a culture where people are afraid to speak or feel as though uh, leadership is not giving them all of the information, but it really um, relates to having a foundation of that very uh, open and honest organizational culture. And I know that for those that are not necessarily in leadership in their organizations, it might be difficult to uh, be in an organization that doesn't have a, an open type of culture, but that really is where it starts because you can do all the training, you can do, you can check all the boxes, but unless the foundational um, underpinning is there with a, with a good, strong, open culture, um, I think you're going to see just a lot of, uh, uh, just taking a lot of action steps that you can cross off the list. This next question builds on the question that you just answered, but a, but a, a different slice. Uh, as an African-American female, I have multiple levels of discrimination from employment opportunities for growth to be judged by the color of my skin when I shop. Do you find that many organizations have policies in place, but they are not enforced or buried and only appear when something of this magnitude happens? Uh, is DNI a standard policy with zero tolerance for inclusion? Do you think that there will be more teeth put into uh, enforcing DNI policies going forward? That's a good question, and like multiple levels on on that question, obviously. But I, you know, do I think most organizations have a a, a, a DNI policy at least? Um, yeah, probably. The, the, the difficulty, I think, is, is unless we're dealing with a quota system, which we're not in most cases, it's very difficult, I think, to, for, for people to identify when you have not followed your code. Um, because there's always an excuse, right? Well, they were more qualified. Well, they went to a better school. Well, they did this. Well, they had a better result from you know, their conversations with industry. Whatever it is, I think people can come up with excuses um, to justify almost anything. And so I, I think that's a bit of, I, I think the struggle there is that it's, um, it, it can be very easy to uh, really not follow a DNI policy much at all and make excuses that make it look like you have. Um, so one of the things that I, I do want to say, and I say this uh, about lots of things, I, I realize right now is not a good time probably to be job shopping, but I also do really believe that if you feel that you are in an environment where you are not, as a person of color, that you are not being valued, 
I would work very hard to make sure my resume is in good shape. I would take on every assignment I can find within my organization now to build up my resume. And I would actively move to a place that welcomes the skills and the talents I have. We cannot change everything. And I don't know that uh, as advice I would give to a younger person, you don't need to spend all of your time trying to fix somebody else. Find a place where you are welcomed, can grow, and can thrive, and go there. Uh, mm -hmm. So, sorry, that was a little off track, but Simon, I just had to no. say that. No, that's great. All right, I want to I want to pivot because I want us to start moving towards uh, the way forward. And I just used the word pivot, which is a very overused word right now. I apologize. How about we say shift? <laughs> so, starting with you, Alderman Sawyer. Uh, the, the, the question that kind of leads us into the way forward, what happens when the protests stop and there are no more statements issued? What should we be thinking? How should we be acting? How do we uh, ensure that we don't lose the spark of what's been started? But honestly, I think that if the protests stop and there's been no significant movement or change, you better be worried because the protests will continue. Yeah. And just like you saw that, that, uh, that release of pressure is going to boil up again and it's not going to get any better. So I think it's time for, time for action is right now. It's actually been past the time for action. If we don't act now, you know, what we saw, you know, over these last several days is just a small example of what's going to occur in our cities throughout the nation, if there's not real systemic change in what we do. Uh, so I think that getting ahead of it right now is, is a positive step. Uh, I think that we all need to find out what we can do better, uh, how we can be more inclusive, how we can get more people opportunity, and uh, how we lift so that everyone floats on, on the same level. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to I, I, this, I, I know it sounds redundant, but, you know, we do better when we do better. You know, mm -hmm. so we all have to step up a notch and do more, uh, not just for ourselves, but for our, our surrounding communities, those that you think need a helping hand. They don't want, they don't want your pity. They want assistance and they want real information. They want real opportunity. You know, no one wants that, that handout. And we talked about it last week. Mm -hmm. We want to hand up. We want assistance, not uh, condescension. So I, I believe I, I want to thank the group for doing what you're doing. And I think that's a great step. But when I talked to Brian about this uh, and Brian Bertadoni, who's been really helpful to me in this, uh, since quite honestly, I didn't know this group existed. I know you've been around for 100 years, but it was really enlightening to me uh, to see a group of good minded, uh, well intentioned, like minded individuals that were willing to step out of their respective comfort zones and to talk to someone mm -hmm. like me, a regular guy from the South side of Chicago that just wants to do well by my community and uh, wants to offer a helping hand. So I think that that needs to continue. People need to know what you're doing, uh, but what all of others that are doing that are doing something to go forward to assist those that are experiencing some challenges but want to do well by themselves and by their families. Okay. Paul, Melvin? Yeah, Paul. Um, uh, I'll say, uh, but first I agree with everything the, uh, the alderman has said. The, uh, I, I believe, you know, a couple things. First, my heart breaks that it took us to this point to talk about this kind of change. Mm -hmm. And I feel, um, you know, I feel, you know, I've, I don't look all that old and, you know, I wasn't around when the forum was started, but, um, you know, I remember, you know, 68, I remember the 60s, I remember the 70s, I remember that change of hope and you know what, we're still here, we still have a lot of those same problems, maybe some of those problems are, are even worse than they were back then. And so, um, I think there's a really a need for, uh, you know, deep uh, systemic change. I am hopeful because of, uh, of what the alderman said. I think we could see. Uh, when we, you know, just watching what was happening on TV, that these protests covered uh, every community, seemed to cover every community 
in America, big cities, small cities covered internationally. And I think we also saw that not only the passion and the power behind it, but what could happen if we fail to change. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing is uh, we are, and to be honest, I didn't want to get political, but we are seeing a failure of national leadership. That, that's true. But what we are seeing also is a potential for so, uh, leadership at local level and particularly in the association community. This is what we do as association professionals. And we're really being called upon to help facilitate that change. And I'm frankly inspired. I'm a little bit, you know, um, intimidated, but, but I feel that we as association executives can work together to make this kind of lasting change. And, and I feel that it's our responsibility to do so. And we can do that working with groups like the Forum, with ASAE, welcoming environment and initiatives uh, like that. So just kind of going, but it really is the time for action. You know, I don't, you know, I, I don't think any of us have the specific steps. It's going to take the will. It's going to take that continuing discussion. It's going to take, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, training, putting into place programs that will bring in uh, people of color into organiz your organization, bring them into leadership, create those opportunities. But I think we're at a, a critical inflection point where we could really demonstrate that leadership. You know, and, and I, I think, Paul, to, to, to build on that, I, what I would say is this is the, a, a time to, to move as quickly as we can to start establishing some of those things. So if you don't have a DE&I task force or committee, now is a really good time to start one. If you, you know, if you, if you don't have good policies in your, you know, we should all be looking at our employee manuals and be making sure that they have very strong, very clear language. We can do that right now. So some of these things that that their people are feeling urgency around, we can at least start putting in place. And, and hopefully we won't, this momentum won't go away. I mean, we do have a big activity in November um, that I think is gonna be really interesting. I think that's gonna keep the energy going in heaven only knows what way. But uh, you know, I think, I think we really do need to try to keep this moving, but let's take advantage of the energy right now also. Hmm. Melvin, you get the last word. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, we need to ensure that uh, more voices are at the table and are engaged. Uh, you see that a lot. You see people that have not been uh, active in the political and civic process speaking up, wanting to uh, facilitate some change. Uh, a quick example is that uh, a group of about 20 African American leaders in the travel industry in the in the Convention and Visitors Bureau space will be releasing a letter to the industry this week uh, outlining some specific steps that we'd like to see at least within our space. But you're seeing that all over the all over the place. And one thing I would just say is that we need to make sure that the right people are at the table. There's a tendency to, to take issues like this to some uh, fancy think tank or, or, or something like that. Um, I don't know exactly how you how you do it, but we have to make sure that the right voices are being heard or else we'll be have done this for not but i am hopeful because of the, the level of engagement that i've seen just in the last few weeks awesome i want to say thank you to all of the panelists thank you for all of those who have signed up participated in this discussion it has been recorded association form will share the replay and if you're wondering what the next step is the next step is there will be another conversation circle, but it's going to be different. Instead of panelists, uh, Michelle and the team have decided they want to hear from you. What are you doing real time that's working? So it's almost each one teach one. Everyone sharing. Here's what we're doing real time so that we can all uh, rise together in our learning, in our awareness, in our discovery. Uh, just some quick takeaways. I think for me, number one, having uncomfortable conversations as Alderman Sawyer shared with us, uh, stepping out of our circle. Uh, if everyone in your circle looks like you, your circle is too small. And, and I say that directly and, and as kindly and friendly as I can say that, but we have to begin to say, how do I get out of my group think and begin to stretch myself? Uh, and then also looking at whenever you have an opening in your organization, do you think of a diverse candidate that's black or brown first? 
Uh, so many times black and brown candidates, they have the educational expertise, the opportunity. They just don't have anybody that will open a door, make a phone call, send a text, use their influence. So this is what this circle of conversation uh, is about. Uh, Alderman Sawyer, do you want to have anything before we uh, say goodbye to everyone? No, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I look forward to being a part of any conversations that you all are willing to have. Paul, I'm looking forward to seeing you out in the neighborhood and many of others. Uh, I want to make sure that we continue this, uh, pushing this forward, giving more people an opportunity, and also expose the great work that you all are doing as an organization. So all that in consideration, thank you. And I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Alderman Sawyer. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you soon.